Good evening. I'm Hampton Mayor Donnie Tack, and it's my honor to welcome you to tonight's conversation about the impact of youth violence on Hampton Road cities. Specifically, what are its causes and impacts? How are we addressing it? And are there more effective methods for improving our outcomes? I have as my special guest this evening, Chesapeake Mayor Rick West, Newport News Mayor McKinley Price, Norfolk Mayor Kenneth Alexander, Portsmouth Mayor Shannon Glover, Suffolk Mayor Mike Duman, Virginia Beach Mayor Bobby Dyer, and Executive Director of Cities United, Anthony Smith. Also with me is City of Hampton Communications Strategist, Robin McCormick, who will be fielding your questions and interacting with you on Facebook. Tonight's Mayor, Mayor's Forum is a kickoff event to the City of Hampton's week-long Urgency of Now Symposium on Youth Violence Prevention, sponsored by the City of Hampton's Office of Youth and Young Adult Opportunities in conjunction with Cities United. Several weeks ago, there was a four-day period in the city of Hampton that saw three shootings, two stabbings, and two homicides. A resident emailed me and asked if Hampton was a safe city for his young family. I responded that while the violent instances were both alarming and disturbing, they were also an aberration. The fact is that most shootings in our cities are not random, but involve individuals who are known to each other and have victims who do not cooperate with the police in helping to solve the crime. In the past 13 months of individuals living under COVID-19 pandemic, every city in our region has experienced an uptick in violent crime. According to a January 4th, 2021, 13 News Now report, quote, Hampton Rose had alarming homicide numbers in 2020. The year proved to be a deadly one with most cities in the area seeing an increase in numbers. Some cities even doubled their numbers from 2019. Portsmouth Police said they investigated 34 murders in the city, which is more than a 50% increase from 2019. Norfolk had 48 murders in 2020, compared to 37 in 2019. The largest city in the state, Virginia Beach, recorded 17 homicides in 2020, while Chesapeake Police said 16 murders happened there. On the peninsula, Newport News Police investigated 25 murders in 2020 and in 2019. A spokesman for Hampton Police Division said they had 20 murders in 2020. There were no statistics for Suffolk in the news report. Sadly, the majority of the victims of the homicides were black males between the ages of 15 and 34. A 2019 Centers for Disease and Prevention report found that although black men and boys ages 15 to 34 make up just 2% of the nation's population, they were among 37% of gun homicides that year. The perpetrators were also black males, predominantly within the same age group. Now, I know that those of you who are viewing this presentation will want to label this as black on black crime. However, in 2018, the Federal Bureau of Investigation reported that while 89% of black victims were killed by black offenders, 81% of white victims were killed by white offenders. Cities United is a national organization that has as one of its missions reducing the daily number of black male homicides by 50% by 2025. When the organization started 10 years ago, 14 black males were losing their lives each day by homicide. Two years ago, it was reported that two lives were being saved each year. Now to our mayors. It is often said that there is nothing worse than a young man without hope. In our region, young black males are disproportionately affected by violence. As a mayor, what do you believe can be done to restore hope and reduce violence? Uh, I'll get things rolling. I think one of the reasons that we're here is that youth violence and violence doesn't know any border and it affects us as a 757. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the hope comes from the fact that throughout the great nation, we're seeing tremendous turmoil and chaos and destruction. Um, I'm showing my age now, but when I grew up during the day of uh, watching Leave it to Beaver on the first run, if you disrespected a teacher or a uh, cop, you got in trouble when you got home. And it's just in general, and it's it had nothing to do with race or uh, uh, religion. It just seems that civility and mutual respect are no longer common, you know, in, in, in civil discourse anymore. 
and people are afraid to have the conversations. <clears throat> and youth are re referring to violence more than ever before, where people more and more are carrying firearms, even high school kids. And the point is, though, I think it, it's come with education. Uh, and in terms of sociology, I think we got to agree on one thing. Government can't fix it all. And no matter what interventions we use, you know, somehow I think, yeah, I, I don't want to sound cliche, but we got to go back to those family values that, you know, that were existing some time ago, but, you know, in terms of structure. But once again, I think, uh, you, know, you know, even in the region, you know, we have to create the job opportunities. If you want to give people hope, give, you know, we got to come up with the better jobs. And I think we're all working on that together. But, you know, the journey that we're going to be on, you know, begins tonight. I think we're going to have to meet more frequently and to come up with the solutions. But I think the spirit of cooperation that we have as mayors that have we have been demonstrating is a great start. But, but once again, it's bringing the right people to the table, not being afraid to have those conversations that are tough, finding out what we have in common versus what we have, you know, dividing us and bringing to the table those folks. And, uh, you know, you know, Cities United, I'd love to be able to sit down and talk to you and include things. But, you know, once again, I think this is a great stuff. And Donnie, thanks for hosting this tonight. So Donnie, I'll, uh, I'll join in. Uh, Kenny Alexander here. Um, first, our thoughts and prayers are always with the victims and their families who suffer from senseless uh, gun violence in, in the Hampton Roads region and throughout our nation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the violence that we are experiencing in our communities. But the conversation must also be about hope. And that hope starts with real opportunities, uh, skill development and technical education for the very youth that we are discussing. We must ensure that there are good paying jobs uh, in the region for those uh, young youngsters, but also that the wages, the wages that are being paid are livable wages and uh, there are real opportunities for growth. And uh, it may be an entry level position, but at least it's a good start uh, to a, uh, hopefully to a successful career. Um, so Donnie, the, the hope is real. And the hope starts with this conversation. Uh, but more importantly, we need to be intentional. Uh, we need to meet more often, uh, but also provide the opportunities through skill development, skill trades, Technical, technical education and jobs. Uh, Mayor Tut, it's Mayor Glover. Um, and, and listening to the conversation, uh, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for participating in this very important uh, topic. You know, I had the opportunity probably a couple years ago to participate in a forum with uh, Chief Larry Boone and the now mayor of Baltimore, Maryland, I think his name is Brandon Scott. And one of the things we were talking about was this increase in gun violence, particularly uh, how it impacts communities of color and black males. Uh, the idea that we came up with, and it's not a novel idea, uh, the numbers you just, just, just talked about in terms of black, black male murders uh, would, would lead me to believe as a healthcare professional that not only do we have to look at providing jobs and training and other opportunities, but we've got to look at, you know, looking at this thing at, as a public health crisis. And when you do that, when you look at it as a public health crisis, you get politicians, you get communities, and you get everybody on board. And in fact, you can even get resources to deal with those public health crises. Look, at the end of the day, if, if these kinds of deaths were occurring due to automobiles and other things, we've seen in our history that we have identified where there is a need to outline and define what a public health crisis is. This, in fact, is a public health crisis. And we need to treat it as such, and we need to bring all of the resources together to identify it, educate our folks about it, and, and make the necessary necessary changes.
together. Jim, if you'll hold on one moment, I, I want to pick up on what Mayor Glover just said. And in that 2019 CDC report, a Florida A&M epidemiologist said, quote, gun violence has for the longest time been a public health crisis in the Black community, end quote. If we, do, if we view Black male violence as a public health crisis or issue, does it change our perspective in how we attempt to address it? Mayor West? I'm not sure about the answer specifically to that question, Mayor Tuck. I will just say, I, I agree with what uh, all three of my colleagues have, have said. You know, I, I think it's clear to us, at least in Chesapeake, that most of the, most of the uh, violent uh, deaths have occurred uh, because of gang activity. And so I think you have to start looking at what is, it, what is it that attracts young men to these gangs and how can we, how can we prevent those? Uh, and I don't think it's such a simple answer that we have one solution. Uh, I, I think, uh, Mayor Glover, you're exactly right. It does take. I just want to point to, you know, because a lot of, a lot of uh, stories that didn't turn out well. We have a, uh, had a shooting in our Hoya Acres area of Chesapeake two years ago. Uh, we formed a, a task force of, of, of city city leaders, our, our fire depart, fire chief, our police chief, um, faith community, several church pastors came together, civic leagues, uh, schools. They all came together to ask the question: What is happening in this community? What are the what are the needs? Where are the deficits happening? And, and so, you know, they started doing things that improved the quality of life for that for that community. Uh, things like during the crisis, providing food. And I know we've done that through all of the cities have done those sorts of things. Providing library, mobile library services to kids, giving them Wi-Fi and, and making just generally improving the quality of life. Uh, they were, uh, Dr. Bailey, who was uh, in charge of that for us, told me a story today of, of the churches that came in and said they wanted to spruce up the uh, entrance to the neighborhood. And so they were working on a Saturday morning and all doing their thing. Before the day was up, the community came together and were all out there to helping make that community look better. Uh, when the surveys went out to community members about uh, what they thought the needs were, uh, didn't get a big response. Police officers went door to door asking these, uh, the, the neighbors, what do you think? Here's a survey. Started forming relationships. And now that community knows there's policemen by name. They have a great relationship with them. And I understand that there's uh, the, the, uh, the Civic League president, who was a 75-year-old lady at Fireball, and she, she, she was just praising the result of, of this effort. So it does indeed take a village, but we all have to come together and realize it's not a simple solution. It's not necessarily related just to that act, but just to the guns or just to the uh, person. It's more related to what is happening in their lives to cause them to need to, to go to a gang and start uh, committing these crimes. You know, I guess you said earlier, I mean, this, this, but you know, our crime rate is down 20%, except for homicides. They're up like 85%. I think mean, you said 16, I had 13, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so crazy. I think 2020 is a year of unpredictable uh, numbers and unpredictable results. And I, I think this is no exception. Uh, this is uh, Mayor Price, Newport News. I just want to thank uh, Mayor Tuck for hosting this this forum, and, and I'm proud to join our other mayors. <clears throat> excuse me to discuss this uh, about violence in our communities. And one thing we need to realize is it's not hard being it's not easy being a young person right now in this country. Um, their world has been turned upside down because of this coronavirus um, in midst of a pandemic. We began um, having long discussions about systemic racism and social injustice. And some of them most likely participated in the protests uh, for change. So um, right now it's, it's, it's been a little difficult uh, for, for our youth, but our youth are the people that make things change, make things happen. And a great example of that is our, um, uh, 
I guess the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee during the Civil Rights Era. And, and I share this because it's critically important that we use their voice and their passion to advocate change and the change that needs to take place in our community. We need to listen to them. And you know, one of the things you know we say here in Newport News that if the first time you have a conversation with the youth is that you're trying to ask them a question about a crime or something that has happened, then you've lost from the beginning. There has to be established relationships way prior, as, as uh, Mayor West just stated, prior to anything uh, crime related. The community has to trust the police so that they can call in if something does happen. And that's one of the things we've been trying to work, work through in, in our community over here. So, uh, you know, our chief has uh, sworn in civilian officers that work hard to engage young people. We, we try to have a difficult conversations and we feel we're attempting to do things in a manner that's going to um, hopefully continue to reduce the, the statistics that we're showing um, in, in, in Newport News. So these are things, these conversations that we're having are important and, and I'm happy to join in and, and happy to share. I think some of the things that, that are successful in our community. And I think that's the thing that we should be doing is sharing what has worked in what areas and then sharing them with, with other cities. And, and as uh, Mr. Smith is, is probably will talk about, he has a plethora of things I'm sure as he has traveled around this country to point out things that might work in various communities um, and, and I'd be happy to share some of those that we think have been successful in ours. Uh, Mike Dumin, Mayor Suffolk. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Mayor Tuck, uh, <clears throat> as well as, as the um, Cities United for, to, for affording the opportunity for all of us to get together and collaborate on an issue that affects all our cities to a certain degree. Uh, as Mayor West said, there's not one particular answer to why we have a significant increase in gang activity. Fortunately, from Suffolk standpoint, um, our violent crime rate is up 9%, but our homicides were down 50%, of course, we're dealing with a lower number. And um, I think a lot of it has to do with communication. I mean, Mayor Dyer uh, alluded to respect. And I agree, you know, I, I always say that there, the two R's are what we need to address. And those two R's are respect and responsibility. You know, the lack of respect uh, for authority, the lack of respect for our educators, the lack of respect in, in a lot of <clears throat> ways for our country. If there is no respect, then it's hard to have self-respect. So that in being able to take responsibility, you know, we as leaders, um, business community, or educate, we, we have to take responsibility. Um, as individuals, we need to take responsibility. To Mayor Alexander's point, you're exactly right. I mean, it's, it's a matter of increased guidance. You know, we're about the same age. You know, Mayor Glover might be a little younger, but, you know, we, we live in a society right now where I know growing up, my mother was a mother until our kids, until myself and my four siblings were out of school. Well, currently in today's economic environment, that's very difficult. There are very few families now where both husband and wife are not working. And on the other hand, we look at what our youth is exposed to nowadays. I mean, you've got at 10 years old, our, our youth is exposed to a lot of what I wasn't exposed to. I was 18 or 21, you know, because of the internet. So they're put in a position where they really need twice as much supervision as they're getting. Um, and they're exposed to twice as much as we were. So you're kind of burning the candle at both ends. So the key is communication. Uh, in the city of Suffolk in particular, I mean, I'm not bragging, but I, I believe our police department over the last decade and it's important that as a region, 
like I said, it, it all affects us. It goes from one line to the other line. You look at the perpetrators and, and I'm sure it's the same way. Newport News may have somebody from Suffolk and the gang activity does not have borders as, as May, Mayor Dyer um, pointed out. But it's important that, that we work collaboratively and to Mayor Price's point that we use the knowledge that we're able to gain in each one of our cities and maybe put it together from a regional standpoint. And then we tweak it some based on our, our, our own individual localities. But our police department has engaged in our, in our community. I mean, they reach out, we do national night out, we do a lot of public events. You know, our sheriff's department is in the schools. And from our standpoint, that's worked really well. But I think the key is offering the options. Kids have to have options. They have to have the technical training. They gotta be able to get a job and then they need guidance. And that guidance can come from the parents, um, I can't remember, I believe as Mayor West has said, government can't do it all. And that's true. I mean, we can, it's gotta be a collaborative effort. It's gotta be the parents, it's gotta be the faith-based or um, organizations, it's gotta be the civic leagues. It's gotta be a way to engage our youth before they get to the point where they're ready to, to because they don't have any options. They haven't been given the guidance. So anything that, we can collaborate on that works and and collectively uh, combine our resources to a regional effort, then I am most appreciative of that opportunity. Now, I'm most appreciative if you look at the support this here, we virtually have every single mayor from Hampton Roads. Taking the time, even Mr. Alexander, I don't know how far in the West Coast he was, but you know, I, you know, I appreciate you signing in also. And it just, you know, it just shows where our hearts are. So I'm looking forward to uh, what we're able to accomplish in the future. Thank you. And this question actually is going to be teed up from Mr. Smith. I, I'll go ahead, sir. No, you go well, ahead. Well, well, what I was going to say is this, um, for about the past 18 months or so, uh, Vice Mayor Jimmy Gray, Sinitha White, who's director of our Office of Youth and Young Adult Opportunities, and I've been meeting with um, returning citizens, credible messengers, nonprofits, and some of the youth in our community about the issue of gun violence. And one of the things that's come out of those meetings is that uh, a number of individuals who are, are having problems, um, both in, in, in middle school, high school, even beyond, and even those who wind up in the, um, the judicial system, uh, have experienced trauma. And sometimes that trauma has not been resolved. Uh, and it could be something that happens in the home, something they've experienced outside the home but it's still something that hasn't been dealt with. Now, on your website for Cities United, you have a term called community violence. And I was wondering if you would uh, explain what community violence means and how to implement known solutions that impact uh, this type of violence. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Tuck. And thank you all to the rest of the mayors for joining this conversation. Uh, it's timely and it's important. Uh, and I think as Mayor Glover said, this is a public health crisis that we need to address. Uh, and we need to address it with the full uh, resources that each city has. Uh, but I also think having this regional conversation is very important. I do want to ask answer your quick question real quick, Mayor Tuck. When you asked, would we approach this different if we took a public health approach to this? And the answer is yes. Uh, we have far too long relied on law enforcement, jails, and detention centers to solve a, a salute to come up with solutions to this issue. Uh, so when we think about community violence, it really is saying that we've got to look at the communities where this violence is happening at, and then we got to apply a public health approach to that, right? We've got to you look at the root causes that are have been generational, uh, even though 2020 and 2021 are uh, outliers, these same communities have been dealing with community violence and gun violence for decades. And now we have an opportunity to really address those differently. And uh, when you think about the, the terminology that we use, you know, if you move from violence to community violence, that means you're looking at the community as a whole, not just that incident, but what's taking place in that community for this to happen. And then we come up with different and better solutions. But also if we say we're gonna address this from a public health approach, then we're gonna be looking at the root causes of violence and really putting our, our efforts and our, and our resources to looking at those solutions. Uh, I shared a document in the chat with you all to talk about four proven ways. Uh, we, along with other folks, have been looking at 
things that we know work. And it goes back to your also your 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 as you framed the question, Mayor Tuck, around using folks who are close to the issue, credible messengers, folks returning home, folks who have lived this lifestyle, who are now wanting to be helpful. You put them in, you give them resources, and you give them the tools that they need so that they can be out there and kind of like diffuse uh, it's, uh, incidents from happening. Right, so they know both sides of the gun. They know the would-be shooter and the would-be victim and can really get in the middle of that uh, and, and, and squash that beef and diffuse that. But there's also hospital-based intervention strategies, right? So if somebody uh, presents to the hospital with a shooting or stabbing wound, you, you have a team of folks who know how to go in there at the bedside and spend time with that person and their family, really helping them think through what got you here and what do we need to do so that you don't return or you don't retaliate. So they know how to diffuse all of that and bring these young people into a system where they can then get the support they need to then go on and live their lives. And then there's another model called advanced peace uh, where you really are identifying those would be shooters. Uh, you put them into a fellowship and give them some resources and support that they need so that, that they don't then become the shooter uh, because now they got other options. I think as a, uh, uh, Mayor uh, uh, was just saying that there's options and folks need options. And a lot of these folks have never been given an option before. We talk about the second chance, we talk about a third chance and a fourth chance. Some of these folks have never been given a chance at all because our systems are set up in a way where folks are pushed out of it and not able to participate. Uh, and the last one I will talk about is called group violence intervention. And it's really one where law enforcement and community work hand in hand and in partnership uh, again, identifying those most likely to be the uh, perpetrators and calling them in and having a conversation saying, we know who you are, we know who, you, who your crew is, and we're paying attention. We really want you to stay out of jail. We want you to stay alive. Let us connect you to these community-based services so that then you can move on and have a, a better life. So it really is around this intervention right now. How do we break the cycle of violence? But we also got to think long-term and how do we not only help the young people who are in harm's way, because if a young person's in trouble, most likely their family is. Uh, so cities are well positioned to use all of their support services to really focus in on those families who are most at risk and really coordinate those services with community-based organizations to identify those families that are most at risk, right? Because this is not everybody. Uh, if we go back and look, most cities can identify those who are most likely uh, to be the victim or the perpetrator. And if we focus our energy and time there, and it's not around law enforcement, but it really is around public health approach and looking at the root causes and giving the needed supports, I think we can have a different conversation. I'm gonna follow up on that in a moment, but we're gonna go to Ms. McCormick and share some of the things she's reading on Facebook. Okay, and this one's interesting because we're, we're seeing two opposing views. Craig says the pandemic has made this worse. Um, it, it'll be better when kids get back in school. And Debbie says, don't use COVID as an excuse. But clearly we do know our, our young people have been out of high school. Our young adults have been among the most hurt by job losses and recreational programs and things that used to be positive encounters have not been there during COVID. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, are we using COVID as an excuse? So Mayor Tuck, let me um, uh, jump in. Um, so prior to the pandemic, Norfolk was experiencing the lowest levels of violent crime in decades, uh, record declines in homicide and shootings. Uh, and it's because some of the measures that uh, we have taken uh, over the years. In 2016, we uh, instituted a mandatory uh, review of our police involved uh, shootings, uh, state police, uh, we made a determination to investigate. Uh, our community engagement through uh, programs, one's called 5 and Fades. Uh, our police officers would take our youth to, to the barbershop, spend a Saturday afternoon with them getting their hair cut. So Cops and Curls, our police officers engaging with young uh, ladies in communities of opportunity, or opening our rec centers at midnight for uh, a basketball game with our police officers and, and, our, uh, and our employers. But also, uh, working with uh, the community, our civic communities, our citizens police academy, our, our FBI uh, police academy, uh, and other uh, uh, trusted partners with our 
passes on patrol. And so we were experiencing a, a decrease in the city of Norfolk in, uh, in violent crime. Uh, but the pandemic, of course, uh, not you know, to, to use the pandemic, but it has worsened many of our underlying conditions in, in communities of opportunity, violence, where there's poverty and unemployment, also, this pandemic has also laid bare the, you know, the, ins the, the food and housing insecurity and, and inequities in health care, uh, job losses, businesses have closed, our hospitals have been, uh, been filled. So the pandemic has certainly, certainly played a role in, 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 in the social and economic uh, conditions that we are, uh, that we are experiencing uh, as relates to uh, violence and, 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 and other conditions. So the pandemic is a, is, a, is a factor, not the only factor, but it certainly is a factor in the city of Norfolk. Yeah, Bobby Dyer jumping in. You know, I think uh, Kenny is right. Uh, I think both questions are right. Uh, you know, I, let me sound like a politician, huh? Yes, it, it, it was a, um, how I, a major contributor to what was going on, but if we're going to be intellectually honest, the seeds of the problem have been present for a long time. And well, let me just be honest. We have to be honest. Uh, Virginia Beach has, uh, you know, was known as a very, very safe city for a very long time, but we've been having problems at our ocean front for decades now. And, uh, you know, has it been somewhat curtailed to a degree? But, but once again, you know, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think the playing field has changed. Now, back about a year or so ago, and in, in talking to the governor about getting the beaches open, you know, we pointed out with the COVID, you have to protect, you know, obviously the most susceptible. But when you look at the collateral consequences of the COVID, and what has that proven to be? Increases in depression, suicide alcohol uh, abuse, uh, increase in drug abuse. Um, I, I, can we all say there has been an increase in domestic violence? And take a look what it meant for kids having to stay home and the pressure that the parents were under. Um, it, it created economic and family uh, you know, problems. But, but once again, uh, you know, and then combine this with, you know, with the unfortunate, dare I say, murder of George Floyd, which caused national, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, social justice unrest in this country. Uh, you know, we had a, we had a major incident uh, at our ocean front on March uh, 31st of last year. So all these are combining factors that are, you know, you know, coming together and exacerbating at this point. But you know, the COVID had an effect, but I think that the seeds were there and, you know, prior to, and uh, at some point it would have, uh, uh, would have required our intervention as mayors with or without COVID. My, my comment about the pandemic was not to use it as an excuse because in Newport News, for the last 12 months, we've had decrease in juvenile arrests, juvenile violence, and juvenile victims of crime. But what, what it has pointed out is the inequities in our society as far as uh, you know, technology, as far as resources available, as far as opportunities, as far as jobs. So that's what I was talking about as far as the pandemic. So it, different cities, different things, as you can see, the statistics are different in different, different areas. So why is it in, in Newport News that those, those things happen? And I think it's because it's been a long-term approach years ago, um, probably 10 years when I first ran for mayor, first of all, getting people to see that there was a gang problem and then putting resources, which we did a million, a million and a half for five to six years toward youth violence. And someone just mentioned, we need to, to increase our resources. We have that opportunity now with, with um, American Rescue Plan coming in, we should take some of that money and put it in our plans for gun and violence reduction. Uh, we also should see that what's available. Uh, Delegate Price has, has put in a bill that $25,000 grant to do a community assessment. Uh, that that money is available now. So we need to know about the things that are available to us and be able to use those so that we can take advantage of them. 
And that's what we should be sharing. Things, our success stories among one another, maybe not in a public environment, but in where we meet together and talk about what has worked in your city. What is it you're doing that has improved in your city? And how can I take that idea and utilize it in mine? And that's among the questions that I have, but I saw Mr. Smith shifting in his seat. So I think he's anxious to say something. No, no, thank you, Mayor Tuck. I just wanna uh, echo Mayor Price's point with the American Rescue dollars that are coming down the pipe. Uh, we watched Mayor Broom out of Baton Rouge use about 2.5 million of her Curious Act dollars just for what Mayor uh, Price just talked about and really allocating those sources, those resources to support the build out of her, 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 her violence prevention strategy and the work that you all are all talking about. So making sure that those dollars when they come uh, go to that kind of recovery. And I think I also just wanna add to what would be interesting for us to do as to look at who we're losing to gun violence uh, and look at what was happening pre-COVID and then also post-COVID so we can have a real conversation. And I think the mayors have all said it, that there was seeds already planted. And if we can pay attention to, because uh, I think part of this is one, we want to get the homicide and the shooting numbers, but we also want to pay attention to the educational outcome for this population who we're losing to gun violence. We want to see what the job uh, and employment outcomes were and really just take a look at that population. And then that's how we come up with the real solutions. Uh, Cause I think again, to what everybody's point has got to be holistic solutions uh, to really address this problem and this issue that we're all talking about. I'm glad Mr. Smith, you mentioned the educational aspect of it. And, and, and first of all, I, I really appreciate your models that you shared with us. I, I, I was, just talking with our, our police chief. I think our police officers are using the hospital model and getting in, trying to talk to their uh, to the parents about this gang activity and trying to get cooperation and help and helping to resolve some of these problems. But as a former school principal, I, you know, I saw it at a very early age. Uh, there's kids that are not successful. Uh, you know, they are going to continue to. Uh, that's just going to lead to to other types of adverse behaviors. Um, I, Mayor Alexander is doing some great work with, uh, with, with vocational education training uh, in, in uh, automobiles that are, that are you know, all electric and working training people with, uh, uh, to be prepared to work on the wind industry. I think these opportunities for kids who are not successful in trad traditional schools needs to be identified early so that they can find success. They can have that uh, income to give them the, the opportunities to live a productive life. So I, I do think it's, that's very important. I wanna back you up a bit here and, and share some of my own personal experience. Um, I grew up poor, not dirt poor, but still poor and recognize that we live in a capitalistic society. So one of the early opportunities I had, at least as far as earning money was a paper route um, when I was in junior high school, um, twice a week, it wasn't a whole bunch of money, maybe seven, eight dollars a week, but still that was money. Other kids could, you know, pick up bottles and recycle those for, for money. And then later when I was in the uh, 11th grade, there was a neighborhood group for, and I had an opportunity to uh, work for the summer. It was 20 hours a week for about five weeks. But what I'm trying to say is this, I, I know we talk about uh, primarily those folks who may be in high school and beyond creating employment opportunities. But I think we also have to recognize that in some instances, we have young kids who have no means at all. Um, I think uh, Mr. Smith is aware of a couple of stories we heard about one young man who was put out of his house and told by his mother, you were not gonna be any good at all. And he had to fend for himself and says that even now, I think uh, they're afraid to deliver pizzas in his old neighborhood, although I guess he's probably in his 30s or 40s. Um, there's a locally a story about a young man whose parents were drug addicts. And he said that he would spend each night at a bus stop. Um, and yet there was a police officer who wrote citations for him, but he wound up in the criminal justice system. So I'm thinking that in one respect, we have to start intervention much, much earlier um, than maybe post high school or, or when an individual is older and certainly all you know, the job training and things we've talked about are helpful. But I think we've got to realize that there are young kids out there who have no direction, 
um, their home life is not stable, and somehow they are falling through the cracks. And uh, I remember years ago going to uh, a middle school in Hampton and talking, well, actually it was, it was a judge, a circuit court judge who made a presentation of men's group that said, you can go into any middle school in the city and there are teachers there who can tell you who are the individuals who are most likely to wind up in the criminal justice system. So he said, the last opportunity you have really to intervene is at the middle school level. And so we actually have just tried to start a program to get individuals to commit to two and a half years. Uh, they've identified, the school system has identified 100 young boys, and we're trying to find 100 people to mentor them, and we're short. We're, we're well short. Now, pandemic interrupted some of that effort, but we're well short. So there are all kinds of needs. And so one of the questions goes to, first of all, how can education, mentorship programs, and social services better serve African-American males in our communities, again, realizing that some fall through the cracks. Um, Mayor Tuck, um, I could I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's exactly what I was referring to. We need to engage our youth that better earlier than later, even from the element elementary schools on up. Um, I know in our city, uh, law enforcement or sheriff's department that has been. Uh, active in our schools, they engage with the students. You know, we they've addressed drug use, they address gang violence, and most importantly, uh, those kids learn to have a relationship with our law enforcement personnel. That that, that they are not the enemy. I couldn't agree with you uh, more. That when it starts early, it's never too early to start a conversation about responsibility. It's never too early to start a conversation about work ethic. It's never too early to start a conversation about respect because growing up, if, if you are empowered with those attributes, then they will carry over to the other things that we like to talk about, which is the technical education uh, and the opportunities. Um, I agree with Mayor Price 100% that if we work together and talk about our mutual successes uh, and then use that knowledge, then it will, I mean, it will serve us, you know, volumes in the, in the end result. But I could not agree with you more that this type of engagement needs to be done at the earliest stages possible. So. Yeah, Bobby D here. Um, one of the things we're trying a little bit of a grand experiment in Virginia Beach is uh, put together an idea commission. And idea is inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Uh, there's going to be several components of this. One is a social justice component of which uh, hopefully we're going to have a, a former judge on it. We're going to have the Commonwealth attorney. We're going to have a public defender's office. Uh, we're going to have a police chief. And the idea is not to look at just police relations per se. That's part of it. But to take a look at the whole system. And one of the problems is that when people go into the system, that when they come out and can't find a job, they wind up back incarcerated. So we're going to have work with the Workforce Council on this. Uh, we're going to we're going to have a housing component, uh, you know, for affordable housing, transportation. We're also going to engage the uh, faith based communities for community uh, engagement, uh, you know, at all levels. And and, uh, you know, another component is health care, uh, Dr. Cynthia Romero. But we're going to have Linda Bright. Mental health is going to be, I, I really think, part of the equation of how to fix some of this stuff too, you know, that we're dealing with. Uh, so once again, it's, we're gonna try it. We're gonna try to bring as a diversified uh, group of people together. I think part of the problem that I have seen in my focus group of one and that everybody's operating in stovepipes and nobody's really articulating uh, you know, with each other. So we're gonna have folks from our Human Rights Commission with our Minority Business Council, with the workforce development people, with the faith-based communities and everything. And, you know, really try, uh, dare I say, the village approach to things, but it's actually getting down into the communities and, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, from the ground level. 
uh, Mayor, Mayor Dyer, you know, we did something very similar to that uh, 10 years ago. Uh, sorry, I had my uh, uh, picture <laughs> covered there. Um, we brought in uh, Bobby uh, Kipper, who was director of National Center for Prevention of Community Violence, and he was a, a gang reduction specialist. And there's a thing called a, a, a peer model, a P-I-E-R. It's prevention, intervention, enforcement, and reentry. And so we brought in the whole community. And, and that's, that's one of the things that we have to realize. It's not a police problem. It's not a school problem. It's not a church problem. It's everybody's problem to solve gangs. And until you do bring everybody in and they're 100% committed to taking back their communities, taking back their streets, it's not going to work. So, so one of the things we did, our sheriff's department was the one to, to take the re-entry in because these kids and young adults who come back into our communities, if they don't have jobs, if they don't have a plan for them, it's just a vicious cycle. Recidivism rate just increases, we know that. So we, we built programs within the school and the jails. We took the, the box off the, the city employment. We now have an active way of bringing people who wish to join the city uh, and have come out of the system of active employment in, in our city through the public utilities is one of the department that does it. and the sheriff's department leads that, leads that. We have a step program for student employment during the summer for kids who, you know, don't have the, the uh, economic means of, of getting uh, employment. I'm trying to think of the, the one of the men, uh, the, the ministers who was very much involved in gangs in, in the 80s and 90s in Los Angeles. And he said, the best way to stop a bullet is to have a job. We've got to get these kids employed and meaningful employment, youth skills and training. Uh, uh, we have our young adult police, we have youth bill. All of these programs are there. We just need to access them, have the community committed to it. And, and I think you are, you'll have a successful program if you do that. Thank you, McKinley. Thank you. Mayor, what I'm about to say is uh, not maybe a little bit controversial, but you know, when you have kids, when you have schools that are filled with kids that have, and then another school that's filled with kids that have not, even if you provide all these resources for the school that has not, the problems are so overwhelming. You, you 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 sort of uh, don't make a it's it's hard to make a difference. So I, honestly, I, I, this was something that bothered me throughout my uh, educational career is seeing schools that had so many uh, kids with with needs that that weren't being met at home, and so the resources were not available to help meet those needs. And I, so I think if we're going to and I think all these ideas are great, but I do think that it, it, it it's going to take a look at some hard questions like how we how kids are uh, uh, grouped in, in these schools and and where their um, and what their opportunities are. So Mayor West and uh, Mayor Price, I think those are right on point comments, and I think it's again how we frame the conversation. If we really want to make sure all of our kids are safe, healthy, and hopeful we're gonna have different solutions and we're gonna think about this different. And I think what you just said, Mayor West, is just that. We know there's unbalance, right? We know there's two school systems. We know there's two law, I mean, two justice systems. And until we have those hard conversations and say we, we wanna make those shifts, uh, I think we're gonna to continue to be at this pace, right? And, and again, I know, and I've heard that, you know, COVID is a factor and it is a factor in all these other things, but it's like, okay, so what's gonna happen when that's not the thing? And if we don't have this conversation now, to uh, Mayor West's point, it's like, we've got to think about the inequities that the young people who are dying in our streets are dealing with. It's not that they just wake up one day and this is where they choose to be. Uh, somebody said an option, they just don't have those other options. And I think we just got to be real clear that there's some underlying uh, structural issues around racism and other things that we just got to have a conversation about because there's no way to that we should have two different school systems public school systems where we know our kids, some kids are getting what they need and some aren't and think we're gonna have different outcomes. So I just wanted to say, I think again, if we frame it from crime and, 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 uh, and taking back our communities to saying we want all of our kids to be safe, healthy and hopeful, and we use this public health lens, we have different solutions to these issues. 
because then it's about how do we make sure we can we intervene when kids when we see kids are in trouble we help them get back on the right track we go a little bit deeper and say so if you're in trouble what's happening in your house and can we put supports there so that you and your family are good because then at the end of the day if we can get you all to be successful then the city's more successful uh, last thing I will say, uh, Mayor Tuck, before you, uh, you jump in, is that Philadelphia Controller put out a report in 2019 and talked about if we invest, uh, they said $30,000 per homicide in this prevention and intervention work, that, and then five to 10 years, they would see a huge reduction in community violence, but they would also see a return on investment because uh, property taxes go up. There's more tax revenue from folks working. So there's just all these things that happen. So it's best to invest in the prevention and intervention stuff now, because that's where you're gonna get your return on your investment at. Not only that we're keeping kids alive, but the city can thrive as well. So I just wanted to add that piece to that, Mayor Tuck. Well, that's another one of my questions I'm saving for the end, but <laughs> I'm gonna go to um, Ms. McCormick just to see some of the things that she's uh, reading on Facebook. Well, one of the biggest discussions I'm seeing is a lot of folks, um, Mary, Philip, a bunch of people are saying the government should have more interactions with police, have more rec centers, open the libraries all night, and a lot of government solutions. And then we're hearing from Kalicia and a few other people are saying, you know what, fund the grassroots organizations. The government doesn't need to pay for the government. We need to have stable funding for a lot of our grassroots community organizations. How do we divide that pie? So, and and someone, someone want to say something? Yeah, I to respond to that because yeah. I think one, two groups that I don't think we've talked enough about, and that's the parents and the kids themselves. And until we ask them what their needs are, it's us trying to solve problems that we may not know about. So if, if we would have some of these discussions with, with uh, some of the youth, they have some excellent suggestions as far as the things that they would wish to have in, in their clubs or the libraries. Uh, and the parents can give you particular things that they're seeing at home, especially in this environment where kids are at home uh, more now. So I think those are two groups we, we need to emphasize as well. Mayor Dyer? Yeah, um, Robin, let me just say this, all the above. I think it's gonna take a very broad brush approach to all this. But let me tell you one of the problems that we are all facing right now, you know, with the way things have been, you know, nationally, you know, it, you know, recruiting police officers is going to be more of a challenge than it ever has been. Uh, in Virginia Beach, we're 99 to 100 officers short, uh, you know, according to our allowed FTEs. Our new police chief has said to do the job the way we should, we need 150. But once again, uh, applications are not pouring in. And heavens knows that we have tried uh, to recruit, to re uh, regret, uh, you know, to reflect the demographics of the city and minority recruitment, you know, remains a high challenge. So once again, it's uh, getting the police officers in, but you have to make sure that you know, we, you know, that we recruit quality and in, quality individuals. And um, I think that's a, one of the challenges that we're all going to share going forward. But once again, you know, to overcome this um, speed bump we're all fa uh, facing is to concurrently go and what McKinley said, you know, let's get to the families. Let's try to nip things in the bud so we don't have this you know, escalation and crime and get, uh, you know, some of the youth movement. People join gangs as because that substitutes for their families. So once again, if we can, uh, you know, work on that with the faith base and all the other things, you know, I think that would be helpful. And that's one of my questions, but I'm going to uh, address what you said, Mayor Dyer. Earlier today, I was with our fire chief as well as our interim police chief. And in my comment to them, and this was on the face of uh, discussion of what transpired in uh, in Windsor, all white, as well as the most recent shooting in Minneapolis. And, and my point was, and maybe I'm an optimist, but there was a time when we were concerned about an all volunteer military, and yet people still join the military. And I, and I fully believe that the individuals have it in the heart 
for public service and that individuals will join the police department. There will be individuals who want to be fire officials. There will be individuals who want to be an EMS, EMS, EMS um, uh, employees because I think there is something special about people that wants to give. And maybe policing as it is now, maybe policing as it was 10 years ago, certainly policing as it was 25 years ago will evolve. And with that evolution, you will get a different type of police officer. I think, and without necessarily going heavily into that, we are asking too much of our police that um, they're asked to be social workers or asked to be mental health professionals or asked to do um, a whole lot of things that aren't necessarily either in their training or really isn't a part of the job description. And I think that's why we have uh, some of the instances that we have now, very, very unfortunate. But I do believe that, that there is a time coming that yes, we may not have full staff uh, police departments, but I think we, will, we won't suffer from having individuals who will serve and will serve honorably. And of course, we always talk about the few bad apples, but the challenge really is weeding out those few bad apples. I wanna go back to a couple of things. One, when I worked for the city of Norfolk um, years ago on the eighth floor, the same floor that my office was, they had an office called Second Chances. I don't know if it's still there, but the idea was really, and, it, and I think it was novel at that time, but it was designed to give individuals, returning citizens, an opportunity. I think as policymakers, we need to try and figure out what we can do to either try and reduce some of the costs that these individuals incur while they are incarcerated, you know, court costs still go on to the point that even when they get out, they still have these fees hanging over them, which makes it difficult if you don't have employment to pay off these fines. Um, the other part is that, um, and I, I, I believe I'm correct, that they can't necessarily live in, in certain types of housing because of having criminal records. So I think if we want to try and reduce recidivism, if we want to try and um, have these individuals believe that we believe that if they serve their time, then their slate should be clean, then we need to remove, remove some of the barriers and impediments to their becoming full citizens again. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Chuck, Kenny Alexander, uh, yes, a second chances program, you're absolutely right. It's a reentry program. Uh, that is in partnership not only with the city of Norfolk, uh, but Garden of Hope uh, Ministries, uh, Pastor Kurt Houston and uh, Mr. Fonzo Albert and others uh, help um, run that program. Um, but you're absolutely right. They are barrier crimes. These barrier crimes that a lot of individuals have on their records have not been removed. Those barrier crimes prevent them from holding certain jobs, living in certain communities, but also uh, it hurts their chances of getting credentials or getting uh, certifications in certain uh, technical high demand uh, employment. And so there are some pu public policy reforms that we should sponsor and have our uh, friends in the General Assembly uh, to, uh, to remove uh, those barrier crimes, uh, allowing relatives to visit uh, parents who may live in a uh, public housing, uh, but because they are a felon uh, and they have not had their felon uh, conviction removed from their records, uh, they, they are prohibited from staying or visiting uh, certain communities and, and holding certain jobs. But also I think that part of what we have to also look at is how are we going to approach crime? I know this is a probably a sore subject, However, we're going to have to uh, think about uh, community policing. Uh, we'll, uh, are we going to return back to uh, a paramilitary style policing? Uh, after 9-11, most communities went to a paramilitary style policing. But in recent years, you know, communities re returned to community policing. And I think this is a balance. A part of listening to families and and, and, and communities about 
programs and activities to prevent crimes from happening in the first place. That early intervention, I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. I think Mayor Price, you're absolutely uh, correct. Community policing with parents and the very youth engage about the activities and the programs and the services that would lead them to uh, not commit crimes in the first place is certainly something that we should look at together and collaborate on. But also we should revisit how are we going to police our communities? Those bad, those persons who bring drugs and guns into our communities, we need to weed them out and we need to prevent them from taking advantage of our communities in the first place. And that's a conversation that we, we should be having as well. I, I would agree with that. And, and that's not going to happen until your community sees that community policing is for real and that they trust your police department enough to report those things before they, they explode. You know, one of the things too that, that I just want to use an example of the most striking thing I heard as a, as a person who was going out and interviewing youth and trying to find out what their problems were. We went to every boys club in the city. We went into the juvenile detention. And when a 16 year old who was double homicide, he said, how did you get here? What, what was it that got you here? And his statement was, no one has ever said that they love me. I, I mean, I can't not think of that almost daily. We have to have our kids to have unconditional love, no matter where they are in their lives, where they're born, what, what, what resources they have, what conditions they are under. Someone has to attach to that kid and help and be a mentor. One, one of the things I admire about my sheriff is that he believes in mentorship, one-on-one, -on -one, and everybody can commit to that. Every adult can just take one kid, put them under your wing, and help him through life. If we as a society would do that, I think we'd be a whole lot better off. I agree. Let me let me share a personal story. And um, it wasn't until maybe in the last five or six years that I started um, doing research on Ancestry.com and realized that my father, um, his father died, I guess when my father was probably just maybe less than 15 months old. And Growing up, one of the things that I always saw my father do was include my childhood friends in different activities we did as a family, whether it was going to the uh, annual summer church picnic or um, just you know, sometimes giving them employment opportunity. I mean, my father's job was only nine months out of the year. He was cooking a fraternity house. So in the summer, we cut grass, we washed windows, uh, we uh, waxed floors, we did a number of different things. But when he saw an opportunity to include my friends so they could, again, make some money, he did that. And I never realized that part of the reason that he did that, again, was because he grew up without a father. Um, so I've, I've been a big brother. I've been a, uh, a foster parent, primarily because of the example of my father. I think the challenge for so many of us, Mayor Price, is that um, either we, we, we raise our own children and, and maybe we spend time with our grandchildren, but we feel that our job is done and we don't have time for anybody else's children. And that's the unfortunate aspect of it, again, is that um, you know, we've tried to, I always said try to identify 100 males for these young boys that we were trying to mentor in this program here. And you know, we generally got a great number of women, and I, and I apologize, I said there's nothing wrong against women, but a lot of these young boys don't see male role models in their lives. They go to, Elementary schools that have primarily uh, women principals and, and women teachers, and they go to, to middle schools and somewhat similar situations there. So they need to have male role models in their lives. But a lot of individuals are afraid to move outside their comfort zones and expose themselves to somebody else's um, child. And I think that's so unfortunate that we've got to do a better job particular in father absent families, trying to um, take some youth under our wings, some young boy, and try and show him the right way. And I think that's a challenge for all of us. I wanted to ask a question here. Um, and we've talked about it a little bit, who are the key stakeholders 
in your community that you believe should be engaged in this narrative on violence among black males and black male achievement? Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't want to seem like I'm do dominating the conversation here, but I got a got a whole bunch of population going on. Uh, you know, let me put it this way, whether it be taken, you know, somebody inspirational, uh, whether it be Pharrell Williams, but yeah, we got to get, you know, if we're going to appeal to you, sometimes, uh, you know, you know, folks that uh, from the 1950s, like myself, could maybe not the best messenger. But the thing is, go out, we can find the, the inspirational people that, you know, can do the messages. And, you know, I think that, but, but once again, I think it's going to be that we are unified as leaders trying to do the right thing. Uh, when it comes to even our police, you know, and you said on it before, sometimes discipline is, is an act of love that you really care about somebody. And maybe, you know, let's be intellectually honest, you know, maybe since Ferguson and some other uh, things where police have been criticized, we use the feather a lot, but sometimes I think we all got to be uniformed in enforcing the law in a very reasonable way that, you know, I know this might, might sound kind of uh, uh, hokey, but, you know, that shows the discipline that we, people need and to get people on the right path. You know, sometimes the max sentence is not the way to go. There could be other avenues working with the justice system, um, you know, working with the judges and, you know, things of that, you know, you know, people like that. But I think it's got to be community outreach. I think we should be doing PSAs, um, you know, awareness and just getting into the grassroots of our individual cities. But I think if we're going to be successful collectively, that we're going to have to be kind of uniform in, in our approaches and let people know that it, whether you're in, uh, you know, whether you're in Newport News or Hampton or Suffolk or wherever you're going to be, you know, you're going to, uh, accountability. You know, once again, I think somebody hit on it before, respect and accountability. Um, you know, I think that's what we have to instill by our actions, not just by our words. I think uh, I keep going back to my principal days, but it felt like it, it, I remember uh, 75 to 80 percent of the kids are going to do the right things for the right reasons. They're going to abide by the rules. And then you have that 20 percent like myself, where if I could get away with it, I would probably not abide by the rules. Uh, and, and then you had that of that 20 percent, you had a small two to five percent that no matter what you did, no matter how much you, you tried to love them or to try to, to uh, give them support, their problems were too great or their issues were too, the, too, too enormous to even find a result. And I think that gets to Mayor Alexander's point. That's what's so difficult in today's society is identifying those folks and taking appropriate action to those 2% without making rules and regulations and policies that you know punish that 20% that could have been saved otherwise. And I think that's a huge challenge for us. Uh, and I think if we can figure out how to do that, we would certainly be better off as a society. I for one believe, you know, you ask who the key, key players are, and I, I go back to our Lake uh, uh, Hoy um, community. You know, it was a joint effort with the Civic League, Civic League the folks in the, those uh, houses that, that have a stake and want their, most people want, you know, safe environment. They want their kids to do right. They don't want nonsense going on in the community. I think if you involve those, like you said, Mayor Price, talk to them and ask them what their, what their problems are. Uh, but for me, you know, I always use this expression. There are more people in my city who are praying for me than are criticizing me. And so I do believe that that is the secret. You've got to involve the faith community because that their hearts are in the right place. We'll go to Mayor Glover and Mayor Duman. I don't want to pick on you, but I just want to ask your thoughts on this. So, so for me, it's, it's, it's kind of simple. Um, you, you, you know, I look for our tribal leaders the tribal leaders are going to be those individuals in the community that have earned the respect, that have the resources, that have perhaps the time and the opportunity to give back. 
you know, when I look at successful cities, a successful team, a successful home, everybody's putting something in to the effort to make it a success. So many times in our cities to what some of my colleagues here have said, you know, our, our tribal leaders, some of them older, have been successful. They've kind of left the tribe a little bit. And, and in leaving the tribe, you know, they, they've kind of not given the best that they had left to help those who may not understand what their responsibility is. So for me, I, I try to bring the tribal leaders back to the table and share their stories. And, and, and see, out of that, you get success. And, and anytime you go to a city that's working well, it's those tribal leaders who's keeping it together and bringing folks together. Because at the end of the day, you can't expect for your city, your team, your community to perform well if you're not going to give something back to it so that it can do just that. So that's always been my focus. And, and that's the kind of law that I live by. Thank you, Mayor Tuck. Um, I agree. <clears throat> my, my number one, I think it, if it comes down to one word, it's communication. I mean, everything, I mean, I've been brought up and of course in the business I'm in, it's, it's all about communicating. If we were all mind readers, it would make our lives easier. If, if we could just look at that individual, look at that youth, look at that individual who's been incarcerated and if you could read their mind, then we could solve the world's problems in, in short order. But unfortunately we can't. So I think the key is to engage the community. And it's one of the efforts I'm trying to do is, is open up our lines of communication. Um, I've, I've, I've expressed to so many people, be it in the faith-based autonomy, uh, faith-based community, or just individuals that I know that are in civic leagues, or just the everyday citizens that I deal with. If you hear something, if, if there's a grumbling in the community, you know, I, I give everyone, I said, call me and let me know. The key is that we can, you know, and I hate to use the old proactive reactive, but unfortunately, I mean, it is. I mean, we, if, if, if we're honest enough to recognize that there's a legitimate problem and we can address individuals' concerns, and I'm sure every one of you, I know if I have if 10 individuals call me with a concern or complaint, after I've had the opportunity to communicate and explain to them how the system works, explain to them what's transpired, explain to them what options we have and don't have, nine out of 10 of those people are gonna be satisfied when, I, when we done with the conversation because they just don't understand. Um, I believe it was, as Mayor Price said, we need to engage. We all have enough statistics, I think, within our city to know where a lot of the activity is, you know, where the hot spots are within our city, to go into those neighborhoods and engage with those citizens and ask them what they want, what they, what they feel it will take to improve their situation. But it's just one small aspect. And then from there, uh, just like Mayor Alexander said, it's about opportunity. Matter of fact, Mayor Tuck, you expressed, you had an opportunity to have a paper round. I had an opportunity to cut grass. You know, I had an opportunity to work at Shoney's and do hamburgers for a while. You know, it's all about, you know, what can we do, what we can't do. And, and that guidance, that, that mentorship uh, of one person. And it's, it's just, I mean, it's, to me, it's just mind boggling because it's not a singular solution. It is a myriad of things from everybody, everywhere. Um, I kind of see solving these problems. So many times we look at it from a government standpoint or what have you, we try to solve these problems from the outside in. These problems need to be solved from the inside out. If one person, if each person took responsibility for their own actions, then the problem solved. And I think, you know, yes, we have to provide the resources. We have to provide some means sometime, but we still, to solve the problem, it has to be from the inside out. So, I, you know, it's, it's all about communication and engagement and, and moving in the right direction. Okay, Ms. McCormick, I'll go to you, see what you've got on Facebook and if you have questions. 
Well, we have a lot of people, Joshua, Donna, Sadia, talking about mental health resources. And you have people who can't afford to go to the doctor, but then you also add the stigma of reaching out for mental health and what that means. So how can we better address the needs in that area? Mayor Dyer, you're welcome to dominate the conversation. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, you know, mental health is going to be part of it. Uh, a lot of people that are residing in our sheriff's jail should be in a mental health facility, not in the sheriff's jail. And, you know, that is going to be part of, you know, the solution going forward. And that's why, you know, we have to let people know what is available. And yes, you know, Robin's right. There is a stigma that a lot of people have with mental health issues. But once again, you know, uh, not to use COVID as the excuse, but boy, I tell you what, a lot of people that have been cooped up for a year, uh, you know, it's not a healthy thing. And, uh, you know, Kenny Alexander and I had a chat about six months ago about uh, alcohol sales in our cities going up, you know, that it, 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 it's been tough. And, you know, and when you talk about increases in depression, when people not getting treated for it and, you know, I don't want to sound fatalistic, but, you know, the uh, suicide rates going up. I, my God, are we we're hearing about children committing. I think it was in Las Vegas about a week ago that children uh, in, in elementary school are committing suicide. You know, unless we are going to there has to be a multi pronged approach to what we're talking about. And there has to, we have to deal with the societal problems that are accompanying that, you know, moves people into violence, okay? And, it's, and then because youth violence becomes adult violence, you know, and, uh, you know, but once again, I think, you know, we really have to think, maybe we all have to, uh, you know, kind of pressure our delegation to make sure that we get more resources. You know, after we had our tragedy uh, back in uh, March 31st of 2019, you know, we had to set up, you know, special, uh, we had to bring in counselors immediately and we still are going ongoing. Uh, and talking to Mayor Buddy Dyer out in Orlando, uh, the one thing, you know, he had a tremendous mass shooting, I think 60 plus people uh, were killed, but a lot of people, um, saw the violence and carnage and they weren't expecting the additional monies it was going to take to sustain over years so the mental health is a national problem and unless we deal with it boy it's going to it's going to tear away the soul of our country can i add to that mayor tuck i think yes, it goes, it goes back to your too. question go ahead sir. Sorry. yeah it goes back to your question too around just the build up trauma uh, that communities are also dealing with. So I think if we're thinking about mental health and we're thinking about trauma-informed care, we've got to make it about the healing of the, of the, not just the person, but the community. And I think to, uh, to the mayor's point around taking the stigma off of it is allowing folks to understand this is about dealing with what happened to you and not about who you are. Uh, but it really is around, it goes back to your, your question around this built on day-to-day -day trauma that folks are dealing with and how do you how do you start addressing that, not just with that individual, but as a community? And I think we could probably get to a different place if we start thinking about it as healing, uh, as like as we do with medical doctors and helping people understand that it's uh, taking away some of that, uh, all of that trauma that you had to deal with over the years just growing up. And I, I tell you, uh, you know, once again, I, you know, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm dominating, but you know, I, I come from an inner city, North New Jersey, and I worked in a hospital there for a number of years and, you know, I've seen quite a bit. And I think a problem that we talk about education and we think about outside of the 757, we don't have a problem. But I can tell you that a lot of inner city schools, they have gun detect, uh, metal detectors to get into the building. And the primary function of the students in some of these cities is to survive the day without getting beat up or killed. And when you're worried about that, you know, the effectiveness of education. But, but, but once again, you know, uh, you know I, as a home care physical therapist in a number of cities, I've worked on gunshot victims. And I'll tell you what, it, it, I'm at the point now that, 
you know, we can't tolerate bullets going into people. Uh, and, you know, that's everybody. You know, we have to be known as safe cities. And, you know, tying it to economic development, you know, companies are looking to come here. They're going to know they're going to have to feel safe. They're going to have good, safe schools. They're going to have, uh, you know, the employment opportunity. So, you know, are we filling a social need? But we're also you know, needing that, you know, by elevating uh, our economic development, we can pay for a lot of these programs. So, uh, you know, and bring in more mental health, uh, you know, professionals and things of that nature. And intervention is the best form of prevention. And Mr. Smith, we've got you here from Louisville, primarily for you to tell us about Cities United and the ways that you assist communities specifically. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, again, sharing what we know works uh, is one of the things we come in and do with cities, but then also sharing other resources as you heard Mayor Price talk about uh, what other cities are doing and how you bring those to your city. Uh, one of the big things that we do, and again, this conversation about who needs to be at the table, making sure that mayors and their teams and the city bring all of those folks at the table, especially those young men and boys and their families who are most impacted by violence as we're designing our solutions, right? So we come in and really help mayors in their cities think about their comprehensive public safety strategy. And what are we gonna do collectively to change the course for these young people in our community, right? So I think, you know, we wanna make sure that cities uh, by the end of their engagement with us have a real clear long-term public safety strategy uh, that looks at the root causes, uh, that really thinks about how we redefine and reimagine public safety uh, and really create a space where we can start looking beyond just measuring the homicides, but then going back to what I talked about earlier, looking at once we start keeping these young men alive, are they having different outcomes when it comes to education, employment, uh, are they getting better housing? So that, you know, we, we wanna make sure that kids are alive, but they're able to thrive. Right. And we've not really worked on the solutions to say, OK, we now we, we, we stop the bullets from flying. Now we've got to work on the other stuff. And we're saying we can do all that together. So our big body of work really is is coming in, doing an assessment of where cities are, helping them get connected to some of the best practices in the communities across the country that we know, but then also helping them organize themselves so that they can create and develop not only develop their strategic plan, but also implement it, evaluate it and sustain it for the long term. Hey, um, I, I have two more questions. Hopefully we'll, we'll get those in in the next eight minutes. Um, one is as the policy leader for your locality, how can you build momentum around policy development and funding that supports violence prevention and reduction? And I think one of the suggestions earlier was about using CARES Act money for it, but I think also just how do you build momentum? What, what do you do? What do you have to do? Um, Kenny Alexander. Uh, Mayor, one of the things that we have all experienced at the local level is a decrease in funding from, from the state. Uh, the state has continued to uh, reduce uh, funding, but also um, mandated that we provide certain levels of, of, of services and a certain quality of service with a reduction in, um, in state funding. In addition to that, uh, many of our police departments um, have uh, been forced to implement crisis intervention training, um, how to de-escalate a situation uh, before it, it escalates and, and get out of hand. And you know that required additional funding. And um, in Norfolk, we have made it a goal to have every last one of our sworn officers trained in crisis intervention. Also, uh, our police officers are, are uh, becoming more familiar with uh, persons who are experiencing uh, a mental health crisis and should not, as Mayor Dyer said, should not be taken to the city jail, but should uh, have uh, mental health treatment and have a, 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 a long-term uh, mental health program regimen to keep them well, keep them healthy. And so part of the policy development, I think, is three, uh, three prong. One, uh, mental health intervention and making sure that our citizens are well and, and that they stay well. If it's therapy or medication or, 
or treatment um, and, and not uh, you know, be, be addicted to uh, drugs and, 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 and substance abuse while they're on their medications. The second prong, uh, I think, is the stakeholder engagement, the community engagement, working with the grassroots organizations in our communities, parents and, and the youth, uh, have them engage at that local level to, to, make, to make sure that we are providing the services and the programs and the initiatives that's going to lead them to self-sufficiency and their growth and development. And I think the third and final policy devel development is uh, a coordinated effort amongst our cities as it relates to policing. Um, how do we work together to protect and serve our residents? Uh, I think Mayor Dyer uh, said it best. We're interdependent, we're, inter we're, inter we're interrelated. We're interdependent, we're inter interrelated. Um, you know, violence has no borders. Uh, and so we must work together and th there should be some policy development around those three um, areas, but I'm quite sure there are many other policy development areas that we can collaborate on. If I can, Mayor Tuck, I would also add, you know, as, as we're going into, I don't know how you all, uh, I think part of this is also each of us in our cities taking a look at our budget. And as we propose our budget, uh, making sure that we are prioritizing prevention and intervention strategies. Uh, and some of this is just really assessing what we're already doing uh, and making sure it's better coordinated inside, but also saying, are we investing our resources in the right places? Uh, that's gonna get us to the outcomes that we need to get to. So I think part of it is really taking a hard look, uh, not only at the state level, but also what do we have control over locally and how do we better align that? And the next thing I would also say too, is that making sure that your corporate and philanthropy partners are at the table so that they can help fill those gaps too. And I think because you all are talking about this as a region, making sure that you have your regional funders and your regional corporations at the table saying, this is where we need help. Uh, one of the questions you, uh, one of the concerns you raised, Mayor Tuck, was that there's not enough mentors. Uh, there was a policy that I did for Mayor Fisher because uh, we had the same issue here in Louisville. And one of the things he we were able to do was create a policy that allowed our staff, the local government employees to actually serve as mentors on their work time. Uh, we were able to get that policy passed and gave folks two hours a week to actually go mentor young people where we saw the gap wet, right? So creating that policy allowed one for us to put some skin in the game as a city. Uh, uh, and then also was able to go say to other employers, this is a model that you can do with us so that we can close that gap. Uh, and when we try to do that, then we try to get to 10%. We, there were 6,000 employees at Metro government in Louisville. And then we would have got 10% and then we would have got six, 600 people to actually take on a kid to your point, mentor them. Uh, and another bonus of that was that now you have young people who never thought about city government with somebody working in city government. So you've got young people thinking about a different kind of work experience, a different kind of field. Uh, but you also close your mentor gap. So I would just say, you know, one, uh, there's there's things that we can do inside of city government that can be innovative to kind of help close some of these gaps. And I think I forget the mayor that talked about uh, the the sheriff and the reentry program. I think it was Mayor Price and, and getting the folks coming back in working in city government. How do we even change our hiring practices to say we need to be more equitable? We need to create more space. Uh, for folks who we know are having a hard time finding employment, let us let us close that gap. Because I think then others follow, right? So you all have such a strong bully uh, bull, bull, bull pit and a convenient power that I just want to make sure that we're using that to then get other people to join us along the road. And I want to thank you for that. And Mayor Alexander, when I again was uh, working for the city of Norfolk, they had the opportunity or allowed the opportunity for employees to uh, take uh, time off to do volunteer work. Uh, we actually implemented that in Hampton, I think it was in 2019. The problem was that when we really were able to move into it, we had COVID. And so, again, the mentoring program that we had established in the schools, uh, with schools not in session, we weren't able to, to follow through on it. But I'm hopeful that once we get a little post-COVID, that we'll be able to resume uh, allowing our um, city employees to, to volunteer to do mentoring and, and other kinds of volunteer programs. Look, we are almost at the end of our program. I want to find out if there's anything that is um, 
burning on anyone's heart that you'd like to get in um, before we uh, sign off here. I, like I, a, uh, once again, the big mouth from New Jersey. Uh, what could I tell you? <laughs> uh, I, you know, Donnie, I can't tell you how grateful I am. You put this together and we got together and let's keep it going. You know, let's do this as often as we need. And I spoke to the governor today and hopefully next week there's an announcement about loosening up, uh, hopefully in May. Let's see if we can't get together, maybe even with our police chiefs in person, uh, you know, and, and just, let's keep this conversation going, not only as a group, but, you know, between each other. And, you know, let me just say, I, I'm just delighted the way that the, the mayors in the 757 are just getting along and have been working collegially for some time now. Thank you all. And God bless you. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated this. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor Tucker, one thing that I did want to uh, mention, too, is the, this vaccination thing that happened, I think, really showed us the weakness of our health department. We have to get that funded. Five cities under one director is not going to work for in this region. We have to solve that because there's so much disparity with this vaccination. This is just crazy. Well, on my, my screen, Mayor West, you're next. You're on mute. I can't say too much uh, more than what's been said. I, I've always enjoyed talking with uh, fellow mayors, just always get ideas. I certainly pre uh, appreciate Cities United being part of this conversation. It gives us a lot to think about. We all have our challenges, and, uh, and it's always good to know. You can't really share uh, with other people like you can share with a fellow mayor, because we know that we understand when we talk about Kenny and I continue to talk about the state not doing their, their job and providing funding in so many different areas. So it's good to be with you guys, ladies, and uh, I look forward to continuing. Mayor Alexander. Well, Donnie, let me uh, also add my thanks to you, my many thanks to you in the city of Hampton, Cities United, and uh, it's always good to be with my, uh, my fellow mayors. I look forward to the next conversation, but more importantly, uh, some of the evidence-based solutions that uh, Anthony uh, will bring. And uh, at the next meeting, maybe we can share some of the things that we're doing in our individual cities to make a difference. Thanks, uh, Donnie, again, for bringing us together. Great. Mayor Glover? Well, thanks again, Mayor Tuck, and, 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 and all of these wonderful mayors. It's, it's always a pleasure to learn. I, I came here tonight with an open mind, really, trying to learn and hear what you all are doing in your cities. Uh, I heard Mayor Price talk about the STEP program. We have been looking at that since last year uh, that they put together you know, to get summer jobs for their young people, very successful program. So these are the things I wanna take away, the best practices and continue to build the relationships um, because if we do that consistently, I assure you we will uh, see some some difference in the outcomes. Working with Cities United and organizations like that um, is the best first step we can take. So thank you all. Mayor Duman. Thank you, Mayor Tuck. Uh, Cities United, and um, it's nice to be in a position where I can learn from my more tenured mayors because you've experienced it longer <laughs> than I have, and to have a to have a common goal. I mean, this is not something you know, we've mentioned it on and on again. This affects all, every one of our cities. And so for me, the ability to collaborate with this group of mayors to be able for me to have that foundation to use in our city is just, it's, it's just um, an unbelievable opportunity for the city of Suffolk, an unbelievable opportunity for myself. And I look forward to many, many more of these conversations. So thank you very much. Mr. Smith, you don't get the last word. It goes to Ms. McCormick, but go ahead. Appreciate that, Mayor. Thank you again, Mayor Tuck, for inviting me to be with you all. And thank you, Mayors, for uh, really coming and, 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 and really uh, putting right the, you know, putting this in perspective and you really pulling all your efforts together to make this work. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the things that has been helped us in both 
Newport News and in uh, uh, Hampton with working with the mayors in the cities is they both identified like a, a city liaison that my team works with to really help keep the work moving. Uh, Cause we know mayors are busy. We know you got a bunch of stuff going on. So I would really, really highlight and really ask that if each of you haven't, that you go back and actually identify somebody from your team, uh, connect them with Sanithia White from Mayor Tuck's team. Uh, Cause I think that's gonna be some of the work, the back of the housework that we need to make sure that we're getting done as we continue to come together. So identifying that key leader in your, in your administration is gonna be important. Uh, and I think uh, working with somebody like Sanitha White can really help keep the work moving as you guys uh, come back monthly or however, however we get on the cadence. Uh, so just one thing I want to add that. And then the other thing I would ask is that those mayors who have not already become a part of Cities United, you guys will get an email from me and we would love to have you join uh, so we can really make sure that we can help you build out your strategy and your plans. Uh, but really just thankful to be a part of the conversation and thank you all for caring so much about our kids and coming up with solutions to keep them safe, healthy, and hopeful. Ms. McCormick. Well, I wanna thank everyone who participated in this forum on Facebook because you mayors missed about three quarters of the discussion. I know yours was more important, but theirs is really interesting. So I hope you get a chance to go back and look at those. And I also wanna say, there's a lot of people saying, let's get the youth in the conversation. Let's do this again. This is National Youth Violence Prevention Week, and we in Hampton, this is just the kickoff, and it's been a wonderful kickoff, but we have forums coming all week. Many of them do involve our young people, both juveniles and young adults, and I encourage you to go look for more information. It is at hampton.gov slash R-U-O-N. That's for urgency of now. Thank you. And I want to thank each of our panelists for this evening's Hampton Roads Mayor's Forum on Youth Violence, Chesapeake Mayor Rick West, Newport News Mayor McKinley Price, Norfolk Mayor Kenneth Alexander, Portsmouth Mayor Shannon Glover, Suffolk Mayor Mike Duman, Virginia Beach Mayor Bobby Dyer, and Anthony Smith, Executive Director of Cities United, along with City of Hampton Communications Strategist Robin McCormick. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Sanithia White, Director of the City of Hampton's Office of Youth and Young Adult Opportunities, and Brian Marchese, Marchese and Desia Walker of Hampton's Marketing Inc for their technical support. I invite you to check the City of Hampton's website at hampton.gov slash R-U-O-N for information on the other Urgency of Now symposium activities that are planned this week. Good night and thank you again for joining us. <laughs>